So, an important question we need to ask as a society, no matter what kind of civilization we live in, is how free should the marketplace be? So how close to that free end of the economic spectrum as opposed to the opposite end, which is command, should our economy be? Should the government have regulations? Should it have taxes? And how much of each of those should apply? Uh, should it support businesses? Should it provide subsidies, which are grants to government entities or loans, which have to be paid back? So all of these are ways the government can be involved in the economy. And one other way that I, I've mentioned is that government can also create monopolies, either by providing the only service possible, like the police. The government has a monopoly over police services within the city of Titusville, that'd be an example. Or they can grant monopoly statuses to companies. Like, for instance, Armstrong Cable is the only cable operator allowed within the city of Titusville, so they can also grant monopolies. Those are all ways the government can be involved in the economy. And going back to the time of Adam Smith, the first name on there, he in his book, The Wealth of Nations, wrote about the policy of laissez-faire, which is the same phrase that we use in government when it comes to leadership for someone that doesn't want to micromanage or get involved. And the same is true in economics, that the institution will be less involved if it's using laissez-faire, that it will not have government involvement in the economy. And so he thought that was the best method possible because then people could be free to compete and work against each other through self-interest because they want the best, they want to have the greatest standard of living, so they're going to improve themselves as workers and businesses. And through that system of competition, things will get better and better and better for humanity. Otherwise, it will remain stagnant. And so he thought that this system was best without any type of government intervention because when the government intervenes, it stops competition. It stops the progress that people will drive by working against each other. And inadvertently, when they work against each other, they're producing something better for everybody. And David Ricardo took it even a step further by saying in the 19th century that government should get out of the way of trade. Because at the time of Adam Smith, government operated with the mentality that they needed to be, build up as much wealth as possible for only themselves. So England wanted to only have English people buy from English companies. But at the same time, they expected to be able to sell English products to the rest of the world. And so that type of mercantilism, the idea that you could build up your own wealth through only buying your own products, for instance, he believed was inefficient, and it was also foolish, because if the English are saying it, then the Portuguese are also saying the same thing. Portuguese people should only buy from Portugal, but we want to also sell to the rest of the world. So if everybody's doing that, what they're actually doing is driving down competition, because you only have businesses competing within a country. You don't have businesses competing against companies all around the world, which is better. He also said it, it misallocates resources because obviously there's something that England has, like coal, for instance, that Portugal doesn't. Portugal has a warm Mediterranean climate and grow a lot of different types of crops longer, so it has something that England wants too. So it doesn't make sense to cut off trade through tariffs or export restraints or import quotas or any other barriers that can be thrown up. So he was really the first person to advocate for free trade. And then you have Milton Friedman. He was a conservative economist that existed at the second half of the 20th century, at least that's when he became famous. He influenced people like Ronald Reagan, because at that point we had invented a lot of regulation to safeguard against pollution and safety hazards and labor violations that we felt were going against workers. And we also invented a number of government programs to help address things like poverty. And of course, in order to pay for that, we advocated for higher taxes. So Milton Friedman said, hey, whoa, we're getting way too far away from where Adam Smith advocated. We need to roll back some of these things because they're interfering with economic freedom and efficiency. Remember earlier on I had said there's a trade-off between efficiency and equity. So if you want more equity, less poverty, less people suffering, you have to, of course, trade off or expend efficiency. And so he said we were getting to a point where it was misbalanced and we were decreasing efficiency too much. Uh, the next person I want to play this video about, her name is Ayn Rand, and she's not an economist, she's a philosopher, and she came up with the philosophy of objectivism, which is kind of related to what Adam Smith said. She, she said people are meant to be rational, unlike other animals, 
And in order to be as rational as possible and, and as efficient as possible, we, of course, look out for ourselves first. And so she kind of linked up with this idea of economic freedom in particular. And so in this short video, she'll talk about how there are a lot of capitalists, people that advocate for free market economics, uh, but some of them are real free market supporters and some of them are not. Because even though they say they're free market supporters, there are some business people out there that are really just trying to get whatever they can out of the government. So she'll give you an example here in this short video. There is a very important confusion. What we have to distinguish between are the capitalist industrialists who operate on the free market and the kind of capitalists who operate with government help. Since the United States has been a mixed economy from the beginning, not a fully free capitalist country, but merely the freest up to that point in history, there were government controls and government interference into the economy from the beginning. Only these controls were marginal and minimal and were not able at first to hamper the magnificent progress of this country. Now, there are two ways to get rich and only two. One is to produce your wealth and to trade with other people by voluntary trade to mutual benefit or to acquire wealth by force. To acquire it by force, one must be either an actual criminal or a legalized criminal, that is a man who uses the power of government to grant him special privileges not possessed by his competitors and thus acquire wealth by legalized force, by the force of law. Well, both kinds of capitalists existed in this country from the beginning. And this is the crucial point. All the evils popularly ascribed to capitalists and to capitalism in the 19th century were actually committed by government interference into the economy, by those capitalists who were not free enterprises, who did not function by free market competition and did not rise by merit, or not by merit exclusively, but predominantly and primarily by government help. The best example of this situation exists in the history of the railroad. The railroad, which aroused the greatest popular resentment with some justice, was the, the Central Pacific of California, now known as the Southern Pacific. This was one of the two railroads built by government subsidies. This was the first transcontinental railroad. In the 19th century, the government gave subsidies to the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific to private groups to create a transcontinental railroad building from both ends of the continent. In both cases, the main motive of the men involved in building this railroad, though not the exclusive, but the main motive, was to acquire the subsidies, not to build a railroad. More than that, there was yet no economic need for a transcontinental railroad. There was not enough freight to carry to justify private investment. But the government, under propaganda similar to today's, and such excuses as the prestige of the country decided to build a railroad, and it did so by means of giving subsidies to private groups. Now, this is a classic example of a capitalist of a mixed economy, that is, a man who rises not by merit and economic judgment, but by government pool and special privilege. The builders of this continental railroad had an advantage which no com private competitor could match. They had government subsidies. As a consequence, the Central Pacific held a monopoly in the state of California for about 30 years. Not only did they have the original advantage, but controlling and bribing the legislature of California, they had laws passed which forbade the entry of any competitor into California. To be exact, it, uh, the law forbade any competing railroad to enter any California port. And since most of the freight traffic came through the port, it meant that no railroad could survive economically in the state of California if it did not have access to the port. Several attempts were made by competing private companies 
to break that monopoly of the Central Pacific in California, and of course they failed. Now the Central Pacific engaged in truly immoral and improper economic practices. Namely, they changed their freight rates arbitrarily every year, uh, charging as much as the farmers produced, leaving them practically nothing as profit and barely any seed for the next harvest. Now, the statist collectivist intellectuals, of course, blamed the railroad, private industry. The famous novel by Frank Norris, Octopus, announcing the railroad, was based on the activity of the Central Pacific and uh, was the foundation for the enormous popular hatred of railroads. Yet observe who was the villain in the picture. Not private enterprise, not the free market, but an act of government. Originally, the subsidies of the federal government and then reinforced by the legislation of California, which maintained the monopoly of the Central Pacific and permitted it to engage in all such abuses, delivering the public into its power. It is a net of government special privileges is required to establish any kind of coercive monopoly, and the history of the Central Pacific is a classic example of it. It was the government and the legislature that was guilty of the abuses involved. Instead of identifying this fact, it was free enterprise, the free market that took the blame. If it is asked whether it's a question of dishonest legislatures, it is not. The issue there is that no legislator who has the power of control can be either honest or dishonest. The dishonesty lies not in the person, but in the institution. When a government holds arbitrary power of, over the economy, no matter what the controls and regulations, they will necessarily be unjust because they will necessarily be weighted by force in favor of one group of people at the expense of the others. The proper lesson to have learned should have been the realization that government control can create only harm, injustice, and distortion to the economy and should be repealed. The government should not have had the power to interfere into the economy. It should not have held economic power. But since indeed, and so long as it did, the abuses necessarily had to take place with each control leading to further and more disastrous control. To this day, people have not yet grasped that lesson. And whenever anything goes wrong in any industry, it is always the free market, the free capitalist that takes the blame. And I stress this without exception. If you investigate, you will always find that the source of the evils or the abuses was the government. Government control, not free enterprises or the free market. All right. So she's the extreme example uh, because she makes this case against pollution laws, minimum wage, pretty much everything that you can imagine has to do with government. And there's a little bit of a fallacy because she makes a mistake using some definitive words there. Like, it's always responsible. Well, like when some of the chemical factories in Titusville a long time ago used to dump their waste right into Oil Creek, the government wasn't forcing them to do that but it was still an evil act. And whenever you know a small shop in a rural area out in the Midwest somewhere won't serve someone because they're black or Asian, the government isn't forcing them to do that either. So you can't really blame all evils necessarily on the government. But she makes a case that interference does in decrease efficiency and it makes the companies involved look guilty when in fact it's probably because of some type of government interference in the first place. <clears throat> 